Okay, folks, welcome back to this video. And in the last one, we talked about type two reaction schemes and we introduced a little bit about the mechanism, right? So what you see on the screen right now is a carbon double bond oxygen, and that's my carbonyl bond. And then to the left of that is a random alkyl group. It could be a straight chain. It could be a ring. It could be anything that it wants to be. And then over here to the right hand side, we're seeing another carbon containing group or a hydrogen. And keep in mind, folks, this is the only way that we can get an aldehyde or a ketone. Okay, so the aldehyde and the ketone are the only two functional groups that's in type 2. So it has to be a carbon or it has to be a hydrogen. And that's why this mechanism is a little different. All right, we also said that we can bring in a nucleophile and a nucleophile loves to be neutral. And that nucleophile is going to look and it's going to search and it's going to hunt for anything that is positive or partial positive. Well, we have that. We have that between the carbon and the oxygen. So oxygen is the electron sucker. It's electronegative and it's going to the electrons up and then oxygen says, okay, I've got them. I'm going to have fun. See you later. Bye-bye. And this ox <coughs> the carbon is going to be a partial positive instead. All right. So here is the chance for the nucleophile to come into that carbon. And that carbon is going to accept the nucleophile because it is missing something in its life. And what it's missing is that nucleophile. And it's going to bring it so much happiness and joy if it could just bring it on. And that's why carbon decides to do it. Okay. That's what he does. So carbon finally says oxygen. Here are the electrons. Go have fun. I don't care what you do with them. And then oxygen comes back and says, but wait a minute. I miss you. I love you so much. And please take me back and carbon's going to be a grown-up and says uh-uh you made this mess you caused this problem therefore you're going to have to accept the consequences oxygen and you're going to have to keep those electrons sorry there's nothing that i can do because right now i have a nucleophile and that nucleophile loves me and it treats me pretty good unlike you that was just a user for my electrons so because of that, we have a new product formation and that product formation is this carbon that has this oxygen and that has this R containing group and that on this side also has still the R or the hydrogen and the nucleophile that came in now, which is that new group. All right, now here's where things can get a little tricky. I told you that oxygen can shove the electrons back and carbon says, oh, no, -uh, you caused this problem. You're going to keep them. All right. Well, if a reaction goes forward, that is what happens, folks. If the reaction goes forward, there is no leaving group. Carbon cannot be a leaving group. Hydrogens are not very good leaving groups. There's nothing ugly here, right, for that carbon to kick. So that's why that this is an addition reaction, not a substitution. These are additions. So that nucleophile has came in, that nucleophile has added to the carbon, and that carbon is not going to get rid of anything if a reaction goes forward. And this forms a new product for us. Now, I know we haven't yet addressed this oxygen, and we will because that's not going to stay there. You know, as well as I do, that oxygen with a full-blown negative is not very stable and it's not going to stay where it's at. But here's the issue. A lot of people leave this out, but this reaction is at equilibrium. This can actually go back and forth. So if carbon is stupid enough to take those electrons back, because that oxygen has convinced it. You know those people. Oh, oxygen, carbon, I can't really do anything without you. My life is just not the same. You made me so happy. You know those people. So if oxygen decides to persuade that carbon to take it back, and that carbon, okay, does it, then we get a double bond that does reform. 
But the problem here is that it reverts back onto itself. Not a product is formed, right? It just reverts back to where it started from. So this, in a way, is not a reaction, okay? A reaction has not went forward. We have not formed a new product. Nothing new, right? Can we write down as far as structure goes? So what we are saying here, what I'm saying, is that these reactions, we have to assume that sometimes carbon does take that double bond back. Sometimes it does revert back on itself. Sometimes that carbon double bond oxygen will reform. But a little bit later on, it could break again, and then carbon doesn't play stupid anymore, and it doesn't take oxygen back, and then our nucleophile goes on to that carbon, and it stays for good at that point. So in the beginning, keep in mind, flippity-floppity, we get products, reagents, products, reagents, product, reagents. But if a reaction does go forward, if we do get a product that gets formed, this carbon double bond oxygen does not reform back in the product. It stays as a single bond at this point as long as we satisfy the oxygen that's causing the problem. And once we do that, then this oxygen will not want to form that double bond at that point. So this oxygen has to form first. This negative piece gets created in a way. And that oxygen has time to persuade that carbon to go back and form that double bond again. And if so, bink, we go right back over to our reagents. But if the oxygen does not have time or is not successful to talk that carbon into reforming the double bond, then we can slap a hydrogen or something else positive onto the oxygen. And when we do that, we can shut the oxygen up. We never have to worry about it again. Keep in mind, in other words, this carbon and oxygen was in a relationship. This relationship has been damaged. They have split ways temporarily. Carbon realizes, hey, I'm pretty good. I mean, I'm kind of the happiest I've ever been at this point in my life. And this oxygen says, oh no, what did I do? Can I come back together? Well, if we can quickly be a good friend to carbon. And if we can quickly give that oxygen another partner to preoccupy oxygen's time with, to kind of say, hey, look, there's somebody else out here that loves you, not just me. So why don't you go hound them for a while? Then we can shut the oxygen up. We do not have to worry about oxygen persuading that carbon to reform the double bond. And then we can form our products like we see fit. All right, so there is the reaction scheme for the carbonyl type 2 reactions. Now, I want to do some real examples, right? I mean, there's no sense in talking about all this theoretical kind of stuff if I don't do some real examples. And what I want to do is go back and dig up little potholes along the course of the semester that you might have forgotten about at this point. And I'm going to go back all the way toward the very beginning, and we're going to talk about the Grignard reactions again. Okay, so this gives you a very good review of maybe some of the organometallics that we covered and that we talked about back in the day when we were having so much fun. All right, so let's talk about Grignard. What was Grignard? Do you remember the metal? I hope so. That metal for Grignard was magnesium. So I can get magnesium and I can put that into the presence of ether. And ether was ethyl ethyl ether. That's why it's an ET for ethyl, not ET the terrestrial. So ET2, meaning two ethyl groups, ethyl ethyl ether, which means that this is a carbon and a carbon. There's my two carbons, ethyl, and then the oxygen, and then the carbon, and then the carbon. All right, so this is the ether structure. It was just a solvent. Remember, we couldn't have water. And if I take this magnesium and I react it with an alkyl halide, it didn't really matter which one. I'm just going to pick ethyl bromide here. Then what we can end up doing is forming a Grignard reagent. So magnesium squeezes in the middle, remember that, between the carbon and the bromine. And this is what we call the Grignard 
reagent. And the reason that we did this, folks, for any organometallic mainly, was this was a way that we could create a negatively charged carbon. Remember that? So here I have went back. I've dug back into the organometallics. I've brought them back. And now we have an ethyl group paired onto a magnesium bromide. So this created a negatively charged carbon. And this is one of the ways that we created carbon-containing pieces that were behaving as nucleophiles. And folks, that's how it's going to be related to this lecture because I'm going to use that nucleophile and I'm going to react it with our carbonyl bond. Now, I could have done this at any point in time, but I thought that this would be a very good way toward the end of the semester to go back and pull out little tidbits of information that we've learned along the course of a semester just to do a quick review in the meantime. Because I keep saying, organic is foundational. What you have learned weeks and weeks and weeks ago will come back and bite you in the behind. And here we're seeing it happen. All right. So now I've got this nucleophile. Okay, well, what do you want to do with the nucleophile? We're going to react it. What are you going to react it with? A carbonyl. What type of carbonyl? A type 2 carbonyl. I could have reacted it with type 1 if I wanted, but we'll do a type 2 here. All right, so here I'm just going to put a carbonyl with a hydrogen on either side, a hydrogen to the left and a hydrogen to the right. Do you know what the name of that compound is? I hope so. We just talked about it. That C double bond OH is an aldehyde. Okay, well, I know that this is an aldehyde. There we go. What type of aldehyde is it? Well, there's a one carbon chain. The common name for one carbon is form. So this is formaldehyde. If I wanted to IU pack it, that would be methanol. Methane. Drop the E, add AL for aldehyde. So methanol or formaldehyde. And we're going to react this with our incoming nucleophile. And this is a CH3, CH2 with a MGBR that is present. So that is a Grignard right there. So you had to keep in mind, oh, Grignard, metal, makes the carbons change. That's the whole reason that we use them. These are now negative pieces. They are not positive pieces. So if I wanted to show the curvy arrow mechanism, I would start my arrow at the negative piece. I point it to the partial positive carbon. Bing, there we go. And carbon says, okay, come on. And then oxygen is there and it sucks and sucks and sucks all of those electrons up. And then when we do that, we get a product that begins to get formed. All right, so what is that product? Well, that product is my carbon that now has a single bonded oxygen that is fully negative at this point. And then on this side, we have a hydrogen. And on that side, we have a hydrogen. We've not done anything with that yet. It's still there. And then we have just added on a CH2 and a CH3. So I have elongated a chain. That is what I have done here. All right. So we know that this is not going to stay around very long. That oxygen carries a full-blown negative. And if I want this product to stay around, I have to incorporate a second step in most of these type 2 carbonyls. And the second step is a requirement because I need that oxygen to be satisfied. I need this oxygen to be happy. So that way it doesn't try to push and push and push those electrons back down to create that double bond and it can leave carbon alone. So the only way that I can do that is if I add some type of acid at this point. So I'll just write H+. It can be any type of acid that it wants to be. As long as it's a proton donor, that's really all that we care about. So if we can get a proton to go on to that oxygen and satisfy that oxygen's needs for now then this will stop the constant harassment that we see on that carbon of what was a carbonyl bond. And now we have formed an alcohol 
That's what we formed here, folks. All right. So here's the key with type two reactions. Aldehydes and ketones are going to behave similarly. A nucleophile comes in, breaks the double bond, and this carbon is very hesitant to take the double bond back. And the reason is because its choices are hydrogens and maybe carbons that come along. Or if it's not a carbon, it's a very good group to keep. In other words, they're not very good leaving groups. So carbon has some hesitation. And the only way that we can prevent that double bond to reform is to satisfy that negative oxygen and we will see a protonation almost every single time in the last step of these reactions. And that is why we need that negative on the O to not be there. So a proton serves that purpose. And what we have formed in this reaction, look at this, is an OH group onto a carbon chain. And that OH group right there, that is an alcohol. So you should be able to name that alcohol group. We started that with the beginning of the semester. Look, I have included organometallic examples. I have included alcohol examples. I've included nomenclature. I've included reaction schemes all into one fell swoop. Look at me. So let's go through and talk about how to name that compound. The longest carbon chain here is a three carbon chain. One, two, three. So this is a propane. And then we're going to the E at the end. And we're going to replace that with an OL. Because, folks, it's an alcohol. It ends in OL. So our propanol ends in OL as well. Well, that OH group is onto that carbon. That just so happens to be at the end of that carbon chain. So that is spot number one and spot number two and spot number three. So I can write a one propanol here. Or I can just simply write propanol. And it's understood to be carbon number one. All right, so there you go. Some quick reviews of alcohols, nomenclature of alcohols, organometallics, Grignards, type two reactions, carbonyls, double bond chemistry, electronegativity, the definition of nucleophile, and protonation all in one example. Look at that. I told you it's foundational. It's built up and that's the whole power of organic. All right, so there you go. There's our first example of a type 2 reaction. Again, I hope that it wasn't that difficult because it's not meant to be. All right, now let's take a look at another example. Just to make sure that we fully understand this, that everything is okay. So here I have another aldehyde, but I just don't have a hydrogen to the left. The other example, I did. But here, we'll change it up a little bit, and I don't. All right, so here we go. I'll use another Grignard, and I'll say, what is the product of this reaction? And you're going to look at this and go, psh, psh, no sweat. I've got this. This is, you know, elementary at this point. This is no big deal. All right, so... I'll draw the reaction scheme uh, just so that you can kind of follow what will begin to happen in the product formation. But this is our negative nucleophile piece. That negative nucleophile piece sees that carbon and that carbon shoves the electrons up to the oxygen. The oxygen tries to shove them back down, but carbon says, nope, no way, no how, not this time. So I'm just going to redraw my reagent. That's typically what I do in these reactions, just like they are. That way I don't lose my place. And then I'm going to that double bond in half. And that oxygen gets those electrons because of that. And then we're going to add the nucleophile that came on. And that nucleophile that came on is that CH2 and that CH2 and that CH3. All right. Now this stays temporarily. Until, in step number two, I'll then add H+. Plus, all right? And that H+, plus, the point of that H+, plus is to protonate the oxygen that has now been formed. All right, so I'm just going to redraw it again. No big deal. I can do that. No one's going to scream at me. 
So there's my OH group now. That's still a hydrogen there to the right. Down here, it's still fine. I can still write my piece there. And now, what if I asked you to name everything? What if I said, name the reagents and name the product? You should be able to do that at this point. All right, well, let's kind of go back and review. So if I look at my reagent number one, this is an aldehyde, and this is a total of a one, two, three carbon chain. So I can call this propane, the E, and then add a L for aldehyde. So that is propanyl. Remember, I do not have to give aldehydes numbers because they always happen at the end. They always happen at carbon number one. If that is the only functional group that is present. So propanyl, if that makes you uncomfortable, put a one there. Make yourself happy. That way you know you're not going to get points taken off. So propanyl or one propanyl. All right, so or propion aldehyde. It could be either one if I asked for a common name. So propanyl has reacted with one, two, three, three carbons here. So this is a ethyl. And then MGBR is magnesium bromide. That was a review of organometallics during that time. So one propanyl has reacted with ethyl magnesium bromide and a nucleophilic acyl addition reaction where the ethyl, or sorry, where the propyl group is serving as a nucleophile and it is attacking the partial positive carbon of the acyl group. When that attack takes place, the electrons are shoved up to oxygen, forming an anion. That anion is then protonated with the use of an acid, and that forms an alcohol as the final product. If I look at this alcohol and try to name it, my longest carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is a hexane. Add the OL for hexanol. And folks, where is that OH group located? It's located at carbon number three. So this is a three hexanol. So here we go. We're going to get fancy. One propanol reacts with ethyl magnesium bromide to generate a nucleophilic acyl addition reaction forming 3-hexanol as a product. There you go. That is basically what this is built up to. Once more, all of these different type of topics that we have discussed all throughout the semester are getting wrapped up into one big example at this point. All right. Other things that I can talk about, what type of alcohol is that? Is that a primary alcohol? Is it a secondary alcohol? Is it a tertiary alcohol? What is it? Remember, we talked about that importance as well. Oh, okay, that, that's pretty simple too. This OH group is on to a carbon, and that carbon is attached to two others, one there and one there. So that means that this is a secondary alcohol, Tracy. I know that. So give me the points and hush up and take me off to the next example problem that you want me to do. All right, so that's pretty good. There's a review of even classifications of the different alcohols that we have. All right. Okay, so now we've done two examples of ketone or aldehydes. Let's do an example of a ketone. And what you'll see is that there are really no difference, folks. If you can do one, you can do the rest of them. No big deal. So here we'll do a ketone. I'll keep it kind of simple. There it is. And we'll use another Grignard just so you can kind of keep refreshing that. And we'll use a simple Grignard, CH3, CH2 with a MGBR. And I want to know what goes forward at this point. What type of product is going to be formed? And I'm going to clean this up a little bit. And I'm just going to say, well, in step number two, we're just going to go ahead and add an acid. So we know it's coming. So let's just go ahead and prep for it. All right. So just like before, I will start with my reagent and I'll just redraw it. So CH3, a carbon 
double bond O, a CH2, and a CH3. So I know that when this nucleophile comes in, it's going to attack that carbon of the double bond. <coughs> there it goes. And that oxygen becomes negative because it's received those electrons. And the reason that that happened is because a nucleophile added on to that carbon. And that nucleophile here in this example was a CH2 and a CH3 from the organometallic. Well, I, know, I now know that that oxygen with the negative is not going to stay there. We need to help this out a little bit. And that's the purpose of the hydrogen from the acid. And folks, there is the product for the ketone reaction. No difference. No difference in the aldehydes. It's the same concept. And that's what I keep saying. It's not about memorizing examples. It's about knowing and learning the mechanism. What is happening? Why is it happening? Because only then can you really truly solve these questions that are going to come your way. All right. It's like a math course. I can teach you and show you a procedure to solve an equation. But unless you know the procedure, you can't memorize every single math equation that's out there. And you can't memorize every single organic reaction that's out there either. But if you know the procedure and if you know the proper steps, you would be able to predict the proper things or at least get close to it. All right. So let's go back and kind of review here a little bit. We have a ketone. That ketone has reacted with an organometallic, that is a Grignard, and that has formed a product, and that product is now an alcohol. Let's go through and name them, all right? So if I wanted to name the ketone, I can do that. Not a big deal. A couple of ways that I can do that, actually. So one, two, three, four. This is butane. Blah, blah, blah. Drop the E, add own. And where is that own group? Well, it looks like it's a carbon number two. So 2-butanone is the name of that compound. Or, common name it? Well, C double bond O can be called ketone. And to the left of that is a methyl. To the right of that is an ethyl. So I could use ethyl, methyl, ketone. Either one. I don't really care. Well, that we know the name of this, organometallic. This is a Grignard, but the proper name to this is ethyl, and then the word magnesium, bromide. That's what our Grignard is. Well, I can name the product as well. It's an alcohol. I know how to do that now. So the longest carbon chain that includes the OH group. All right, so I could do one, two, and then go down to three and four. Or I could go one, two, and go across to three and four. Or I could start over on the right-hand side and go one and a two and a three, and then go down to four and then around to five. That's actually my longest carbon chain right there, folks. That would be a little bit tricky unless you double-checked all of your possibilities. There is your longest carbon chain. So one, two, three, four, five. So this is a pentane. Drop the E and add OL for pentanol because it's an alcohol. Where is that alcohol group? Well, it's carbon number three. No matter which way you look at it, it's carbon number three. So three pentanol. Uh, but the problem is that we're leaving off this CH3 group. We haven't named that yet. So we need to go through and we need to name it. So where is that methyl group located? Well, again, no matter which way you go, it doesn't matter. It's still carbon number three. So three methyl 3-pentanol is going to be the name of that alcohol product. All right, so big boy, big girl pants. We're talking like organic chemist. So let's go through the terminology and talk about the reaction. I have taken 2-butanone, also known as ethylmethylketone. And I have reacted that with an organometallic compound called ethyl magnesium bromide. That organic metallic compound has allowed the ethyl group to serve as a nucleophile. That nucleophile is attacking the carbon of the acyl group. 
and that double bond has been destroyed. That allows for the nucleophilic acyl addition reaction to take place. Once that double bond has been destroyed, we have then protonated the reaction. And that protonation step serves to satisfy the negative oxygen that is on the molecule forming an alcohol. And that alcohol molecule is called 3-methyl-3-pentanol. Folks, there you go, right? If you understood that, if you understood that organic chemistry language, you're learning organic. That is what I keep saying in chemistry 251 if you had it with me. Could you imagine going back to the very first day of this semester and I just gave you the verbiage that I gave you just now? You would look at me like I have 15 heads and that I'm crazier than what I sound like through your computer speakers. So if I did that and you ran away from me because you would have no clue what I just talked about, but now, if you could listen to me and follow through and understood that terminology and that language, that means you are learning, that means you're doing your job, and that means I'm doing my job and teaching you organic. And that's what it's all about. All right? So that's where this video is going to stop. And in the next video, we'll continue on with this. We'll keep looking at examples, and we'll get to a point where we'll talk about a more specialized types of reactions as well. So that is where I'm going to stop. Next video, I'll see you with more reaction examples, and that's where we'll pick up.